So just to start here, so we are covering executive function in the classroom, practical strategies for students and teachers. Okay, so um, also uh, again, we are going to be using the chat extensively during uh, this webinar. So we, as much as we can't see your faces, we would love to see you in the chat or with various thumbs up, things like that would be lovely. Okay. All right, so this is our agenda. We're gonna go over what is executive function, which is a, uh, a bit more of a complex topic, topic than you uh, might think. And then we're gonna talk about why is executive function so important? And then we're gonna talk about exactly what is an executive function strategy? Because that's really the key, key thing that is kind of the cornerstone of everything that we do here, our executive function strategies. And while we might all know what executive function the words mean and the word strategy means what do they mean together is really important to get exactly right. And then we're going to talk about how you can get started using uh, our executive function strategies um, in your classrooms tomorrow. Okay. But first off, though, who are we? So we are the Research Institute for Learning and Development. Um, and uh, we are a not for profit who for over 40 years um, has uh, been uh, dedicated to empowering students to understand uh, their learning profiles. We research, develop, and distribute strategies for students with executive function challenges. So uh, we put on many types of PD like this. We put on free webinars and we do more intensive trainings. Uh, we also, we put on uh, conferences. We just did successfully did our first virtual conference this year. Um, and then uh, our uh, the thing that we do that perhaps we're most well known for is that we have created a in-school executive function curriculum called the SMARTS curriculum, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the future. Um, but then we also do specific coaching with teachers. Um, however, we're sort of an interesting organization because we're actually kind of a two-pronged organization. Our sister organization is the Institute for Learning and Development. So the Institute for Learning on, and Development is really focused on individual students. So we are an organization. We are in Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, oh, P.S. Tell me where you're from. If uh, It's so lovely to be on um, a large webinar where we have people from all over. So if you want to, just put in the chat uh, where you're viewing from, because that's one of the, the nice things about being on Zoom is to actually see people from all over. Oh my gosh, here we got Portland, Maine. Uh, we've got Boston, Tewksbury. Oh, excellent, wonderful. Um, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna read those later. So if there is a special student in your life who thinks you needs one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, then the Institute for Learning and Development is really the place to uh, come to. And we are also doing virtual sessions, so you can uh, contact us and me about that later if you would like. So now SMARTS. I said before that SMARTS is our executive function curriculum. We actually have two curriculums. It has its own website. Um, and uh, each curriculum has over 30 lessons where it's a complete executive function curriculum that is specifically made to be imp to be uh, implemented by student by teachers in their own classrooms. Um, it is very versatile and uh, it's modular. So if you like what you see here today uh, in this webinar, a lot of the things that we're talking about today are actually things from the SMARTS curriculum. So. Okay. Um, and then also, so again, if you like this training, this is a free webinar, which is sort of an overview of executive function, but we have just, oh, Bogota, Colombia, I think that might be our farthest. I'm not sure. I'll keep looking. Or London. Oh, wonderful. Um, uh, okay. So I'm <laughs> just excited by geography. Um, and uh, so we also now are starting a whole new uh, section of aid trainings. They literally just went up yesterday. So this is just a little still from that. We actually have about nine that are ready to go. Um, and they are more in depth and they are more things that are sort of the nuts and bolts. We also do a lot of, we have also very popular uh, trainings that are specifically about content areas like reading and math. So, um, okay, so let's move on here. All right. So, um, you, we can't really talk about our organization without talking about um, our president and director and founder, Dr. Lynn Meltzer. And uh, she really wrote the book, 
in fact, many books on executive function. Uh, and she has worked with the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's worked with Tufts. Um, she has been a, an educator who has just been at the forefront of uh, executive function research for years and years and years. Um, and uh, again, she has written a bunch of really wonderful books. If I had to pick a favorite, I would pick the green book, which is really, again, about this nuts and bolts of using executive function in the classroom. So things you can use right now. Um, okay, so that's the spiel for the very beginning. Um, uh, Caitlin, have I missed anything? I think I got I think, it. I think you got it. All right, cool, cool. Excellent. This is one of my executive function hacks is because just want to make sure I remember anything. So I have help from tech support. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Um, righty. So what is executive function? So, okay. What do you, what, just think to yourself, what do you think of when you hear the term executive function? So if you would like to say um, anything in, uh, in the chat, you can, but also that's fine either way. So, you know, uh, organization. Oh, Tara, that is exactly the thing that people say first. So many people, <laughs> so many people, somebody just said life for executive function. That is a fabulous answer. So I, the vast majority of people think that executive function is just organization and um, planning, self-management. Yes, planning and self-management. Absolutely correct. Um, and we are definitely going to kind of go in to more uh, about organization and executive function, but it, that is not just what executive function is. So um, all over uh, the internet, there are lots and lots and lots of different definitions of executive function, but this is our definition of executive function. And so we say that executive function, I'm going to refer to it as EF a lot during this uh, webinar, is a broad term that's used to describe um, the complex cognitive processes that are the foundation for goal-directed behaviors. These processes include organ organizing, goal setting, shifting flexibly or cognitive flexibility, um, accessing working memory, and self-monitoring. Um, so uh, we this, this is a good definition but it's a little nebulous, right? So we're gonna get into kind of the, the meat of exactly sort of uh, what that is. So it can be really hard to get into like what is exactly is executive function without uh, getting concrete. And this is something that we do with our students a lot. So our students really, really, really need executive function taken out of the kind of clouds of definition and into something that they can really sink their teeth into, something concrete. There's a lot of scientists out there that do a lot of amazing work talking about executive functions in the brain, but we're talking practically. So we are going to do a little activity right now. Um, we are going to do an activity where we are going to put a link to a Google survey into the chat and then we will ask you to go to that link and then we're gonna fill a little survey about, uh, that has a bunch of uh, daily activities. And I want you to go through and I want you to click on uh, all the various activities that could be more than one that you think require executive functions in this daily list. Now I'm gonna switch over to this right here. Um, so this is what our little form looks like. For those of you, um, sometimes, again, Zoom can be a little bit weird. Many people can just click on the link in the chat. Some people have to copy the link and paste it into another window. It's just something that Zoom does sometimes. So I'm just gonna read through these for anybody who is on uh, calling in as opposed to visually in. So when do we use executive function processes? So um, organizing your closet, remembering where you put your keys, checking email for typos, playing Uno, walking down the hall, deciding what to make for dinner, calculating a math problem in your head, chewing gum, getting dressed in the morning and checking Facebook. So let's go, okay, we've already got a lot of good responses. Let's go through here. and. P.S. This is just a, a little tip. We adore using, I'm going to make this bigger. Is that easier to see? Okay. Um, we just adore using Google Forms in our uh, trainings with you, but also when we're teaching students online over Zoom, because it's a great interactive, really simple way to uh, get kids involved. So let's look at this. So we said, we said, uh, 
Excellent. 100 percent of people said organizing your closet requires executive function. I certainly agree. Um, and then we have uh, checking an email for typos. About 92% say that that's the executive function task. Uno, a little bit less, but I think this is Uno's an interesting one because you can play Uno without really using many executive function strategies, but you also can be strategic about it. So there's a little bit of wiggle room in these things. Um, walking down the hall, only 56%. So yeah, this one is, again, there are definitely times uh, where, uh, where you could use executive function walking down the hall, so you're injured or something like that. Um, but uh, usually that's not something that we think of typically. Um, and then again, deciding what to make for dinner, absolutely it can uh, require executive function. And yes, chewing gum is, I think the one on the list, this list that most definitely does, uh, does not require executive function uh, strategies as much as everything else on this list. And again, give me rest in the morning. Um, and that definitely, if anybody who has kids who tried to get them out in the morning can know that their executive function isn't quite up to par, that can be hard. And then checking Facebook. Yeah, checking Facebook, uh, it, it's definitely debatable. Um, okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so kids can be uh, like slots in the morning. We have in the chat. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, all righty. Okay, we're going to go back to our excellent. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so that gives you a little bit like taking this kind of wordy uh, definition of executive function and taking it down a little bit into a little bit more specifics. Um, but the core of our definition is these uh, various uh, elements of executive function. We call them cogs. Um, and we think that there are five major cogs. Other uh, researchers think that there's one uh, type of executive function. We, there's, uh, let's see, Tom Brown thinks there's seven. George McCluskey thinks there's 39. So it's not hard and fast, but these are the kind of big buckets that we have found have worked really, really well in uh, working with students. So let's go over them really quickly. So um, there, there's, we're gonna start with uh, organizing up top. So organizing is categorizing and sorting information. Goal setting, working toward desired outcomes. Shifting flexibly, looking again in a brand new way and uh, remembering, accessing working memory, juggling information in the brain and self-checking, recognizing one's most common mistakes. Now, we're gonna go now in depth into each of these cogs because this is very general definition. So first off, let's talk about cognitive flexibility. So Dr. Meltzer thinks that cognitive flexibility is really the one, in fact, perhaps the most important one, because that's where everything starts. If you can't uh, uh, be flexible in your thinking, then it's really hard to take into new strategies. So cognitive flexibility is the ability to think flexibly and to shift perspectives and approaches easily. So an example we often use with our students and we're gonna use with you is putting up uh, a pictures like the one you see below me. So who here can see in this picture two faces? You can let me know in the chat if you like. You can give me a thumbs up if you want. People can see the two faces. Yeah, we've got some yeses there. This is not a, yeah, there we go, a very old picture. Now, if you shift your thinking, can you see the vase that is also in this picture, the vase? Okay, we've got some more vases there. And so yes, the, uh, the faces are in this blue area. And then if you shift your thinking, you can see the vase in the middle in the negative space. Now, this is a really good example to use with students because they get it. But of course, it doesn't tell us that much um, about exactly how you use it sort of in, in a school setting and stuff. So um, cognitive flexibility is it's needed a lot for shifting schedules. Um, so if you have students who have a hard time shifting from one class to another, their brains are kind of thinking about math and they can't quite get into reading, that's somebody who might have an issue with cognitive flexibility. Um, it's also, you need to be cognitively flexible to approach um, solving a problem. 
Um, so if you are, uh, say you have a student who is trying to solve a math problem one way and it's just not working and you try to say, hey, here's another way to solve the problem and they just can't hear it, that's somebody who's having a bit of an issue with cognitive flexibility. Also, um, you need to be able to shift if you're uh, flexibly, if you're doing a writing assignment between main ideas, details, and the relevant information. Um, and so like that is all things that are really, really important with cognitive flexibility. Um, so, okay, cool. So, um, challenges with cognitive flexibility. P.S. I talk really fast. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, the recording of this entire webinar, we're going to send you so you can go back and you can uh, watch it at leisure. We just have so much good information to get through. Okay, so students may be asked to build on topics they learn from another content area of one content area to another. But if some, they might have difficulty synthesizing new information with previously learned concepts. Um, and then students might take uh, tests that are in one format um, other than the way that they studied or took notes. So this one is, it's amazing how much it trips up students that if you saw again, like math problems one way, but they know how to do the problem, but then in the test, if it's in a word problem, it, it because it looks so different, they can't shift their brain to know, to realize they know how to solve it. Um, and then uh, also they could be asked to shift between main ideas and details uh, with ease. And so both of those two things in the left-hand column, um, students may have difficulty with the last thing uh, relating to the last thing there on the column uh, on the right, shifting between multiple word meanings, text structures, or problem solving approaches. That's quick overview of cognitive flexibility. Now goal setting. So goal setting refers to the ability to identify a desired outcome uh, based on awareness of personal strengths and challenges. Um, so goal setting is needed for understanding the purpose of an academic task. That is one thing that goal setting is uh, needed for. So we stress, stress, stress goal setting when we're having, uh, when we're teaching students strategies because we might teach them a strategy and then they learn it and then they think they're done with it. They don't understand why they're doing it. So you have to contextualize so that students understand the goal of this assignment is to do X. Um, and then of course, also goal setting um, is, uh, is really, really important for being able to motivate through difficult times and persevering through setbacks and actually being able to achieve your goals. And um, we distinguish a lot between short-term goals, long-term goals, and um, executive function is really important for also learning how to set uh, uh, specific goals, appropriate goals. Any student, every teacher who's had a student who said, I want to be a, a sports superstar as like their end goal knows that you have to say, okay, great goal. Let's talk more specifically about what is achievable in this uh, moment uh, in front of us. So let's talk about these challenges of the goal setting. So students may ask to complete projects that have multiple steps. They might have difficulty breaking down large assignments into small steps. So they might just see one big assignment and they don't know where to start and they don't know how to uh, break down the steps to achieve their goals. Students may be asked to use multiple skills to perform tasks, but they might have a problem seeing the big picture. So that's what I mean is, is that like they might be asked to do multiple skills and they don't see that those skills are building up into a big project or a big learning goal. So they don't know why they're doing something. And then um, they might identify uh, be asked to identify personal goals, but then have a hard time setting appropriately challenging goals in and out of school. Okay. Uh, excellent. All right. Organizing and prioritizing. So this is a kind of a two for one. Um, so uh, organizing involves creating a meaningful structure for ordering parts into a cohesive whole and prioritizing involves ordering these parts based on relative importance. So organizing can be organizing materials, say like a messy backpack or homework, um, or it can also be organizing ideas and time. So as I said, like while most people think of executive function as just organizing, while it's more than that, organizing is a huge part of that. Now, prioritizing is assigning order to various tasks like schoolwork or extracurricular work, but 
It can also um, be, so knowing sort of like uh, organizing what you want to do versus what you have to do. It can also um, be something that in an actual assignment, so a big complicated assignment, students might be fit, like have the knowledge to complete the assignment. But if there's so many things to do in the assignment, if they don't know how to prioritize where to start, it can become overwhelming and they can get stuck. So challenges with organizing and prioritizing. So students may be asked to write multiple paragraph essays, but they may have difficulty identifying the big picture versus the main ideas and relevant details. They just might be overwhelmed by all the information in a text um, or, uh, or what they should include. Uh, students may be asked to participate in extracurricular activities and complete academic tasks. However, they may have difficulty balancing time required to engage a want to and complete academic tasks that are have to what I just chatted about a second ago. Okay. Oh, I've got a, a response from the chat. I should check out the book, Duck Rabbit, in terms of teaching cognitive flexibility. Oh, thank you. I definitely will. Um, okay, let's talk about working memory. Um, so, you know, most people are very aware of long-term memory and short-term memory, but working memory is kind of in the middle, as you see it there. Working memory is the ability to hold information in one's mind and to mentally manipulate the information. So as you can see here on our little picture, uh, it's incredibly important for doing mental calculations. You have to remember the information and then be able to change it and then actually also remember the outcome. Um, so working memory is needed to follow multi-step directions, complete complex math operations, and remembering important uh, information during a test. So challenges with working memory. So students may be asked to summarize information uh, that they read, but they also may have difficulty remembering steps of a procedure, the requirements of an assignment, verbal directions, or the sequence of events in a story. Then they also uh, might be asked to perform multiple step word problems, but students who have working memory issues might have difficulty performing mental computation, also remembering the steps and then getting them in the right order, which is so important for math. And then students may be asked to recall information efficiently, and that's global. You know, if students have uh, be asked to do that, but they have uh, difficulty uh, with being able to recall information effectively, that's going to be uh, an issue with all of their schoolwork. Okay. All right. Now, self-monitoring and self-checking. And so we're going to actually talk about these. They're, they're under the same cog, but we're going to talk about them a little separately. So self-monitoring refers to students' ongoing process of reflecting and using strategies to track their own performance and outcomes. So this is the kind of self-monitoring that is like, am I on task now? Um, or how so, or am I wandering? Am I doing what I'm meant to be doing in school now, or am I doing something else? So if there's that type of self-monitoring, um, and as you can see the, the, our little illustration there says, how can I readjust my strategies so I can get back on track? Um, and then, okay, self-checking. Uh, self-checking occurs either during an academic task or after an academic task has been completed. Students need to carefully review and check assignments using their knowledge of their most common errors. So we could say like checking work at the end of a test or checking a rubric before submitting a paper. Um, and uh, so self-checking and self -che and monitoring together, um, monitoring process while working independently or in groups, maintaining focus, checking work on a test or paper. Uh, so we all have students or have been students ourselves that uh, will do really, really, really great work and then not check it and miss something key and then get marked down for that, even if the students actually know the information. And this is just generally a global thing about executive function. We're talking uh, students who have poor executive function skills um, have a problem taking the things they know 
They absolutely know the material and applying it. And I say that students with ex executive function, uh, problems with executive function, honestly, these, are, these strategies are important for every single student. We all have had issues uh, using all of our parts of executive function at one time or another. And uh, these practices are going to help every single student that you have. All right, challenges with self-monitoring and self-checking. Students may be asked to complete and turn in homework, written assignments, and projects. However, they may have difficulty keeping track of materials and uh, allocate time to complete tasks with multiple deadlines. Um, and that's also, they might have problems editing papers and projects, it kind of goes to the first one. And then if they have problems self-monitoring or self-checking, then they, they might be asked to participate in collaborative school activities, but not engage properly with peers. And that's really self-monitoring. So knowing, self-monitoring is kind of knowing what you're doing and why. Okay, and now, we're going kind of forgetting to <laughs> turn in the assignment indeed. Um, okay, but now we're gonna talk about metacognition. So metacognition is absolutely vital, absolutely vital. It's not one of our cogs in kind of whether I've talked to you about it, but it is so, so, so important that we spend a lot of time on it whenever we are uh, doing trainings or working with students. So metacognition is thinking about how uh, you think and learn um, and how students can understand their strengths and challenges. So metacognition is needed for learning all strategies, learning from mistakes, taking on appropriate challenges. Um, so we have to, if students are, uh, if we're going to strengthen students' ability to use executive function strategies, we have to boost their self-awareness. Only when students have an accurate picture of their strengths and challenges are they able to apply the strategies that work best for them. And that is something we really, really stress is that students actually need to know where they need a, a helpful strategy to be able to actually advance. And our strategies that we, we really, really stress that student strategies are not um, uh, one size fits all that they are really something that students have to work and try different strategies until they find the one that works for them. And they won't know which one works for them if they are not up on their metacognition. Okay, so there again are the elements of executive function. So we're gonna talk a little more specifically about um, how you can use executive function in the classroom, but I just wanna put that back up there again. Okay, so now we're on to our second part of this, uh, this webinar, understanding EF difficulties. Now we've talked about executive function, let's talk about EF difficulties specifically. So we're going, um, so, okay. Um, so we've talked about what executive function is, but, but why? do students have difficulty with executive function? A lot of that has to do with the demands that we place on students. So a student, often they, uh, there we go, let's see if that's actually. So a student um, will if often have a ton of different uh, things that we're asking them to do. And it can be really, really hard um, if uh, we, uh, there are challenges of living in an increasingly technological world uh, where uh, they have um, lots and lots of different uh, stimuli that is happening, where uh, they have smartphones, they have computers, they have YouTube, they have everything that is vying for their attention. And that is makes it really, really hard for them to actually look at what uh, they we are asking them to actually do. Also, we're asking them to do a ton of things. We're asking, um, if you ask a student to do one thing, like most of the time they could do it, but then you ask them to do two, and that's two, that's more, and then three, and then four, and then suddenly they're just uh, drowning in all the various things that we are asking them to do, both in life and in school. So we really see that they're inundated with all the various things. So students, especially those with EF difficulties, find themselves drenched in all the things that we are asking them to do. And that is where uh, all, a lot of the issues come from. So we are in our strategies are trying to find a way to 
help students manage all of these things. So our students, they may be smart, but they get stuck. And this is kind of our foundational concept that we like to refer to as the clogged funnel. So the clogged funnel uh, is when students have cognitive ability and experience to perform a given academic task and yet are unable to produce. Being blocked in this way is a sure sign of executive function difficulties. Um, so students experience this clogged funnel when the demands being placed on them exceed their capacity. And without the ability to break down a task or prioritize steps, they can become overwhelmed and they can just shut down. So classic examples of a clogged funnel include students who forget an answer that they actually know while taking a test or completing homework and then losing it, or even struggling to initiate or get started on a test because they're just kind of frozen. Okay, so what is executive function? Uh, let's talk about a student perspective. So these are quotes from actual students. So one student says, I don't know what it is, but I know I don't have it. And, uh, and then we have another student who says, uh, the stuff I'm bad at, that's what executive function is. And then we have another student who says, doing what the teacher says. So of course, none of these are actually executive function uh, at all. But all of these come from a, from a student self-concept of weakness. And um, they're looking at, at executive functions as this weird nebulous thing that's just something that they can't do or don't have, which of course is absolutely not true. And we, we have to shut down this kind of thinking entirely because um, we like to teach executive function um, from a view of strength. Because of course, executive function is something that everybody has we use it every single day. You wouldn't be able to get up and go about your day without executive function processes, right? Um, but uh, we, this something, hold on a second. Yes, pardon me. There we go, captions, good. Okay, got it, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, ooh. Well, boop, 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 here we go. Oh, we're back, amazing, all right. So, um, okay, uh, so we really, again, like to, uh, there we go. Um, we really like to say to students, you have executive function. It's just that we need strategies to help you break down tasks. You can really show us what you know. So we're gonna do a little activity here. Um, so we're gonna look at a couple of different of uh, uh, sort of theoretical student profiles. And we're gonna ask you to participate to vote on where their executive function issue is coming from. So just to start off, we're just gonna do a little, uh, we're gonna do this by doing annotate. So we have turned on that everybody should be able to annotate. We're gonna be doing um, a little first just test to make sure that we can all do this here. Um, so if you are trying to annotate, you can go to, there's, you can see at the top of your Zoom screen, there's a little green thing that says you are viewing a research ILD screen. And then next to that, it says view options. You can open that up. And if you go down to annotate, that shall, hey, Annie Brown, thank you. You're the first person to annotate. If you can annotate right on my screen, go ahead, show me what's up. Um, and hey, there we go. Wonderful, beautiful, excellent. I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. All right. I'm going to clear you out now and we're going to go on to the next thing. Great. Okay, here we go. All right, there we go. All right. There we go. So I'm going to ask you, um, I'm going to ask you to use the stamp feature uh, for uh, on this next one. This is just to just, just, just get, um, oh, I'm sorry if you're unable to annotate. You can put it in the chat what you what your answers are if you cannot annotate or if you just prefer not to. Um, we're going to use a little check mark here. So just to see if people uh, can go ahead and do that there. Um, I'm going to clear and go on to the next. Wonderful. I'm going to clear you all. And we're going to go on to the next one here. All right. All right. Clear all drawings. Uh, okay. So nobody annotate for just a second while I move on to my next uh, slide here. Okay. All right, I cannot move on, I'm sorry, until uh, you, okay, here we go. All right. 
Okay, there we go. Excellent. Got it. So which is the best breast for breakfast carb? So show me with your annotations, um, with your check marks. What do you think is the best breakfast carb there? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Big circle, really? Oh, well, gosh, I think that uh, I've got a few none because yeah, people don't sometimes people don't eat breakfast or don't eat carbs. We've got I think bagels is really taking it. I, you know, I like the strong showing for pizza. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, breakfast pizza entirely. Okay, you you all got it. You're you're experts. This took a there was a lot more to do when we uh, had to uh, do this at the beginning of uh, our various lockdowns. So I'm going to clear everybody for a second. Okay, so theoretically, um, so we have a student who says uh, I'm so bad at math, uh, it's just hopeless. Well, that doesn't tell us a lot about actually what their executive function issue is. But let's look at the teacher report. So Christina is missing a lot of math homework and it's hurting her grade. She does her classwork and seems to keep up, but most homework is incomplete or missing since we switched to Google Classroom, the problem is worse. So now we're gonna go to the next page. I'm gonna ask you to vote uh, for which is uh, the, which cog you think that Christina is having trouble with. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, and again, there's multiple answers. There absolutely is. Absolutely, yes, I, we're getting a lot of shifting. Absolutely, um, a lot of organizing. Yes, I think organizing and self-checking are the really big ones here. It's not that she's bad at math, it's that she can't get everything together to show uh, she actually knows. Okay, I'm gonna clear you all here. We're gonna go on to the next one. Okay, here we go, so. All right, okay. So um, now we have, um, what am I supposed to do? The project is impossible. Okay, again, that doesn't tell us a lot, but let's see what the teacher says here. Okay, teacher report. Jose is very creative and has great ideas, but he has not completed his outline for his final project. When uh, given class time to work, he usually spends time off task. So uh, show me what cogs you think that, uh, he is getting uh, held up on. Yes, absolutely. We got organizing. I mean, so this is this is there's this one actually has qu quite a few different ones it could be, but definitely goal setting for sure. Uh, self checking, absolutely. And again, our perennial favorite, organizing. Um, okay, let's go to the next one here. All right, I'm gonna clear y'all here. I y'all are fast on this, and that's fabulous. Okay, um, so uh, then we have, my teacher is so mean, I always get in trouble for no reason. So I think we've all heard this before, but rarely is something for no reason. So let's see what the teacher report is. Teacher report, Miles really struggles with transitions. When the start of a day or uh, when we switch to a new subject, he starts playing with his friends and ignores directions. When corrected, he gets angry and refuses to work. So where do you think uh, this, <laughs> there, yeah, this one is, is pretty clear there. It is shifting, absolutely. Um, with uh, uh, cognitive flexibility, uh, shifting, and certainly self-monitoring too, even though that is, uh, that's sort of folded in here, but like actually knowing that it's time um, to, uh, to, uh, when it's time to do different things. Uh, somebody in the chat asked, what's the best answer? There is no best answer. If I said best, uh, shame on me. I just mean that that one is uh, very, very clearly something you have to work at. Because again, all, all of these do overlap a little bit, um, but being able to actually, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear you guys all here, you folks. Um, being able to sort of clearly break down a problem that a student is having and not keep it nebulous, but actually think, okay, where is the executive function issue? That is how you will know how to uh, attack to actually give them um, success. So to support EF across the grade levels, we also need to teach strategies that meet the demands placed on students in the classroom. So what I mean here is that um, our, our demands on students increase as they uh, go through the grades. So a specific example, so I'm saying is that, um, let's say identifying the main idea of a text. Text. This is a task that gets much more complex as students get older. Early reading books often have the main idea and a huge text on the cover accompanied by pictures and large headings inside. By high school, however, the pictures and the headings have disappeared. 
In addition, elementary teachers are more likely to feel responsible for teaching how to identify the main ideas, whereas in high school, many teachers may feel that students should know this already. Um, however, if we don't teach students explicitly from elementary school the strategies that they need, then they won't know how to uh, implement those things in high school. So that is part of what we're getting at. Um, and uh, so with strategies, they can integrate more sophisticated information and they can uh, learn to succeed in the higher grades. Okay, I'm gonna ask, all right, here we go. Um, and if I could ask you to, uh, to not uh, uh, annotate anymore, that would be lovely, thank you very much. Okay, so explicit instruction and repeated practice are the keys to improving EF. So we're gonna do a little activity here. Okay, so let's talk about what is a strategy, all right? So this is an activity that we do as part of the SMARTS curriculum to explain what a successful strategy is because students often don't know what a strategy is because it's kind of a weird term. We use it all the time in our regular day life, but you can feel free to create this, you recreate this uh, specific uh, uh, activity uh, in your own classrooms. So um, the definition of a strategy, strategies are systematic, systematic processes that students use to learn. So in particular, executive function strategies focus on improving students' ability to organize, plan, prioritize, access working memory, shift flexibly, and to self-monitor. So these are on the, pay on the screen here are all different types of strategies. So um, tell me, what do you think? Do you think these strategies are uh, like really strategic or are they not? And uh, we, are, we are running out of time. So I'm just gonna sort of pop on here. So um, the issue with these is that some of these strategies um, are, can be used in a very strategic way, um, but also uh, they can be used in an unstrategic way. So let's take highlighting. Um, if you've ever had a student who just highlights the entire page yellow, uh, we call that yellow page syndrome. That's not strategic. That is not actually helping them um, to sort information and to actually get where they need to go. Whereas if you can teach us highlighting strategy that really uh, focuses, um, we have ones called purposeful highlighting that actually really helps break up main ideas and details. That is a very strategic strategy. So like an, uh, an example that is not a real EF strategy is just, I'm gonna read my notes a million times, as opposed to, um, or I'll just make 50 flashcards and just then just read them. So these approaches are demonstrating effort, but they do not show a strategic approach to learn and they may result in a negative outcome. Okay, so these are responses that we often see from our students that they don't wanna learn strategy because it takes too much time. I don't need a strategy, I can just do it. Um, and that's something that uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, and why do we have to do this? So we're going to do a little activity. Um, this is called the I spy activity. And uh, this is one of the ways that we sort of illustrate to students why strategy is important and what they actually uh, can, uh, can get out of it. So I'm going to put up a list of things that are in this picture. All right, I'm going to give you one minute to try to find as many of them as you possibly can. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to ask you about how you do that after. All right. So let's let us give that a try here. Okay. If it will actually do so. All right. Hold on a second. And clear all drawings and stop annotating and there we go. All right, one minute. And I'm disabling annotations because it's uh, it's making it hard to advance. So, but thank you so much for your for your enthusiasm. Uh, so just keep a sort of list of yourself.
Okay, I think it's been again, not quite a minute, but that's all right. So um, first I'm gonna show you where everything is. Does everybody think they found them all? Um, so we have our stone statue, that's right down here. We have Patrick Starr from SpongeBob. We've got the smiley face. Most people get the smiley face, it's the most obvious one. The book is really hard. The book is over here. It's like a board book that, you know, for like toddlers, but because it's on its side, it's hard to see. We have our lion who's right here. And the phone, this one's particularly hard for students, is right here because it's that old style of phone indeed. So, but again, uh, we really want to talk about how you found all of those things. So we're gonna do another Google form. So we're gonna put another Google form in the chat there. I'm gonna ask you, what strategies did you use to find the objects? And you can put on the form as many um, as you would like. So let us go over here. Indeed, excellent. Uh, if you could not annotate on there, that would be wonderful uh, to actually just fill out the, the, the uh, Okay, excellent. So uh, mark any of these that apply and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about them. So the thing is, is that this is great for students because I spy is a thing that they have played many, many times. And then we ask them questions like this. Again, we wouldn't particularly ask them uh, in terms of we, we, would, we would ask them how that they actually found all the things and then they can come up with strategies. And then we would say, see, that's what I mean by strategy. So let's see here. Um, let's see, 83% of you said you read the list and then scanned the picture. Um, and then let's see, 16% said you found them in order. A lot of people do the easy ones first, get that yellow smiley face first, for sure. And then some people very systematic. You broke in uh, the picture into areas um, and then uh, other people look for specific colors and shapes. Other people scanned the picture from top to bottom. People look for certain colors. Um, and then again, some people couldn't find the phone. Uh, I know that can be tough. So the questions we would ask them is, what strategies do you think work best for you? What do you think these strategies, why do you think these strategies work best? And what strategies did not work as well as you thought they would? Um, and so I, again, I would point out after doing this with students, I would have them do that. We'd have a whole discussion about it again, uh, where I need to wrap up. So, uh, you know, we're not doing that here, but if I was doing it in a classroom, I would do this exact thing. Um, and I would say, I would ask them those questions and then have them use their, uh, metacognition and think about, okay, what strategies worked well for me? So this thing said, this great activity is like, this is a strategy and then has them start thinking about did this strategy work well for me or not? Okay, so let's go on to the next thing here. So here we go. So let's think here, um, what makes a strategy an I see strategy? So this is, um, we go from I spy to I see. So an I see strategy, it stands for individualized, systematic, efficient, and effective. So individualized, it needs to be or self-generated by the student. Students know best what does or does not work for them. Systematic, so able to be used in a routine and regular way. Efficient, um, or it gets the job done successfully. If it's not efficient, it's not a good strategy. And effective, does it, if it works for the task at hand, different strategies work for different tasks. So let's look at a few different uh, sample strategies here. So um, as Marcus reads his science textbook, he takes notes that can uh, be later turned into a study guide by changing section headings into questions. So um, is this an IC strategy? All right, here we go. So is this an IC strategy? So yes, it's individualized. Marcus creates his own note-taking system by changing the section headings into questions. This is questions, what are the part of the solar system? It's systematic. Marcus reads a new section in a chapter. He creates a question by looking at the section heading and writes in his notebook in blue ink. He answers the questions in his notebook in green ink. It's efficient. 
when Marcus has a task, he will be prepared because he uses his he uses notes as a study guide. The information is already organized in a study guide in a structured, easily accessible way that makes sense to him and saves him time. And effective, Marcus is his uh, astronomy test. So again, this is what we actually do with our students. So look at the look at scenario number one. Marcus assigns this tomorrow. He begins studying at 7 p.m. To study, he rereads the chapter and his notes. Is this an IC strategy? So you can put it in the chat if you want. Um, and uh, we will actually look in here. So it's not individualized. Um, and uh, it, so it's, 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 it's general, it's not just for him. Um, it's not systematic. It's re just rereading is just uh, going from beginning to end. It's actually not having a plan about how you're gonna study. It's not efficient. It takes a long time and you don't actually get that much out of it. There's no specific purpose to his reading. Um, and it's not effective. By reading, uh, by reading the uh, entire uh, chapter, he's not focused on what he needs to be studying. And that's, he's not ensured that he'll actually remember what he reads and it's actually what he needs for the test. So let's look at scenario two, okay? Uh, Jimmy is reading To Kill a Mockingbird. At the end of each chapter, he writes two sentences summarizing the chapter on a sticky note. So is this an IC strategy? Um, okay, so, uh, so first, yes, it is individualized. So this is something that uh, he, has, uh, it meets the criteria, he uses sticky notes. That's a specific thing that he likes to use. Um, it's systematic. He uses the same organized strategy for each chapter. Um, it's efficient because it's a quick way to summarize each chapter. It doesn't take all that much time. That's, this is the thing we always tell our students, like, when they're like, strategies take too long, or like, it takes a little while to learn, but it'll save you time in the future. And that's a great hook. Um, and, uh, and then it's effective. Summarizing each chapter will increase his comprehension of the entire novel. So, um, okay, so we, we've actually really already covered that one. So let's talk about a couple steps for getting started in our last five minutes here. So seven steps for getting started. Okay, identify the, uh, your EF areas of need as we talked about in the beginning. Select EF strategies. Choose EF strategies that align with real life tasks. Try to connect your strategies to tasks that students understand, are engaged with, homework, tasks, and projects. It's not just EF for EF sake. Pick a strategic time. Select a time to teach the strategy that allows students to use the strategies you are teaching them as soon as possible. You don't want to teach a strategy and then have a week go by because students, it's going to be gone from their brains. Uh, and then modify as needed to make sure you deliver the strategy in a way that acknowledges the strengths and challenges of your student. Be aware of reading level, amount of writing required. So we really say modify. It has to work with your population, um, exactly with your students' needs. You wanna teach explicitly too. You don't wanna just fold in the strategies. You want to say, this is the strategy. This is its name. This is when we use it. Cause then students can't generalize um and uh, easily and so if they they'll often if you teach them the strategy in english they might think this is only for english it's not coming for other things so this is a little uh way that we like to go about it um we say and you can you can start at any part of uh this sort of uh image here so we say you model the strategies then you have the students do independent practice and you reflect on it. This is part of that where you say, this is the strategy that we just learned. And that reflecting is really what cements it in the brain. And then you activate prior knowledge by basically saying, when could you use this strategy? And you talk about when you could use it in other parts of school, or you refer back to other strategies that we've covered before. And again, you can go sort of back and forward in this, but making it explicit is absolutely essential to uh, making these strategies really embedded for your students now and as they go through their school career. And then you need to reflect frequently, here we are. Ask students to reflect on their strategy use. Remember to help students understand their strengths and challenges, reflect on their performance and make plans for next time. And then revisit and review. Explicit instruction and repeated practice are the keys to improving EF. Show back to the strategies. Additional activities, discussion questions, application to new subjects and tasks, vocab, and modeling. 
Okay, so, oh, look at that. We're almost bang on time. So um, I want to say before we uh, continue on, um, so we have an evaluation for you, which uh, our lovely tech support is going to be putting into the chat in just a second. Um, we would so appreciate if you fill this out because we have been counting on uh, responses from all of our attendees throughout the year. Improving our sessions is extremely important to us. Also, there are those of you who have asked about uh, certificates. So uh, we are offering certificates of participation um, in this webinar. Um, those participation certificates are uh, $15. To get them, you need to fill out the evaluation. Once you've filled out the evaluation and we have your information, we will then email you out um, a link to be able to uh, get your certificate. Now, if you need to prove to your school that you were here, you don't need a certificate, you're gonna get an email from us. And in that email, they're gonna have um, the uh, the PDF of the of the PowerPoint that we just went through today. We're going to have some information about um, our earlier, our coming up free webinars, our paid trainings, um, and lots of information. Um, and then we are going to have the evaluation here. Um, and so we're gonna and we're gonna have the recording of this webinar. So um, that all that information is going to be there, but I just wanted to make sure that I, you know, said that about the uh, the certificates. And actually, I think I will show you one more thing here. Um, and finally, um, we are a we are a small uh, organization, and we uh, are approachable. And we would love it if you have questions, you should contact us. Um, so that is my email up there. And then um, our smarts director, um, uh, Michael Greshler, um, is right there. Uh, if you have questions about our upcoming offerings, if you have questions about the smarts program, um, if you just want to chat, uh, you can go ahead and you can contact us there. Also, um, we just put our social media links into the chat there. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar, we have a playlist that has about 10 free webinars that we have done uh, previously. Uh, and they are just up on YouTube and they are available. So you're welcome to check them out. You can, uh, we do a, we write a blog every week that has lots of great uh, information. Um, follow us on Twitter and all that kind of thing. Um, but you've been a, uh, a lovely audience and thank you so much for uh, your being wonderful because, uh, you know, at this time it's, we're trying to make things as participatory, as participatory as possible during these times. And it's great to have people who are really, really engaged. So excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much. I think that is all I have there. I have gotten anything major. All right. I think you've covered it. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much and have a great day. You'll get that email from us uh, very shortly and do please fill out the evaluation. Uh, we, I cannot tell you how much we rely on them. All right, have a good day. Bye.